good morning in this session we are going to tell about the introduction to neurons and neural networks i am dr maitri datta professor and head of electronics and communication engineering department of nitrpltr chandigarh so the contents of this session will be about the biological neuron artificial neuron about signal functions definition of artificial neural network characteristics of artificial neural network components of artificial neural network and various applications of neural network so to discuss about first about the biological neuron as you know our brain is a collection of 10 billion interconnected neurons brain consists of mainly three parts one is your cerebrum another is your cerebellum and third one is your medulla oblongata cerebrum is the just like as your walnut and the outer surface strong surface of our brain that is known as your cerebrum at our back there is some projection is there that is known as your cerebellum both the cerebrum and the cerebellum these act as a uh, outer surface and the they do the work of various types of activities and the control functions of our brain third one is your medulla oblongata and pons there are two parts one is your pons another is your medulla oblongata medulla oblongata is basically taking care of our for example some activities like breathing your heart beats uh your uh, audible and visible some points and pons are generally uh, are used to control our movement so in medulla oblongata there are three parts main three parts there are some nucleus or the main cell are, is there there are three parts one is your um, thalamus another is your hypothalamus and third one is your hippocampus now thalamus is the main nucleus of the brain which consists of the various in huge number of the neurons and this thalamus is basically for the sensory organs for our sensor sensory organs the thalamus uh, uh, cell is mainly important our auditory and visionary these two functions are taking care taken care of by the thalamus so uh, this is basically your uh, the brain brain consists of i have told that collection of about 10 billion interconnected neurons and each neuron the cells are consisting of the neurons and each neuron is a cell that uses the biochemical reactions that will receive that will process and that will transmit so neuron is basically there are so many neurons in the brains neuron is basically a cell which will receive some input which will process some calculations and it will give some output or transmit some information now about biological neuron right now let us see that what is biological neuron what are a brain consisting of neuron consisting of now first point that this point is known as your soma that is your main nucleus that is your cell or soma which contains the which contains the cells nucleus and other vital components and the soma i have told you the neuron will take the input the input will come from this tree like structure these are known as your dendrites so dendrites are the part of the tree like structure you have seen that these are some branches just like as your branches of tree and with this all branches these are the branches and with this all branches the input are coming from different branches and it will reach to the soma with the help of these dendrites this structure is known as your dendrites so it will do some calculation soma will do some calculation and finally the output will go through this tubular like structure that is known as your axon this is your axon hillock 
this is your exon hillock what what is known as your exon hillock exon hillock is the main base through which the exon or the tubular shape is coming out right when this exon is a tubular shape and it is going to the different terminal nodes these are my nodes these are known as your terminal nodes end nodes these nodes will be connected to the another neuron with the help of again dendrites right so the actual this is the uh, schematic diagram of one biological neuron that is inputs are coming through the dendrites processes is going on into the soma then output is going out through the exon and those output is going to the terminal nodes now in the terminal nodes that means from exon it is coming from exon it is coming to this terminal button or the terminal nodes and these terminal nodes will be connected to the other dendrites of the other neuron with the help of some transmitters right these are known as your neurotransmitters which are technical term is your synapses the synapse is basically nothing but a synaptic gaps these are nothing but some transmitters or known as your neurotransmitter which will take the signal from the terminal button and it will give the to the dendrites and from the dendrites again the output of the dendrites it will go to the different types of another neuron so this is coming from one neuron here that is one neuron from the neuron this inputs were coming with the dendrites this it is coming out through the exon from the exon it is going to the terminal button and from the terminal button it is going to the dendrites for the other neurons and it is communicating with the dendrites with the help of some neurotransmitters which are known as your synapses and from this dendrites again it will go to the second neuron so this was my first neuron and this was my the second neuron that only it has been told in this site in this slide exon is a tubular extension from the cell soma that carries an electrical signal away from the soma to another neuron for processing and each terminal button is connected to the other neurons with the small gap that is known as your synaptic gap or the synapse <coughs> now besides the neurons <coughs> besides this cell or this dendrites or this exon there are some cells are connected or are present to protect the neurons those cells are known as your glial cells there are various types of cells are present but main are the glial cells there are three parts of the glial cells one is your astroglia another is your microglia and third one is your oligodendroglia and i have shown the diagram of the membrane of a rat this is your membrane of a rat this is your red in color that means in the brain of a rat is your red in color and this astroglia and microglia and the oligodendroglia these are the three parts of the glial cells astroglia is basically the cell which protect or physically support the neurons right microglia is a uh, cell or microglia is a is one type of the glial cell which will connect to the other neurons and it will clean up clean up the cell right clean up the neuron this is used for regularly clean up the neuron third one is your oligodendroglia oligodendroglia it creates or it develops a membrane or processes which will just you know the cover up the exon for example this is our exon this one our exon and this exon within the exon that will act as a uh, membrane that means it will it will support like this and it will be like a membrane of the it will it, it will be like a membrane it will protect the exon so these are the three cells which are used for the protection or the physical support of the neurons this is about the biological neuron now the actual neural network it has been started nearly 80 years ago where the scientists have thought 
that not too much not it it cannot actually just replace your biological neuron but some purpose parts of the work of the biological neuron or the our brain can be done with the help of the artificial neuron artificial neuron means that we will create that neuron we will tell the neuron what to work and how to work and the neuron will give the output according to our desire that is known as your artificial neuron but definitely we cannot replace the our biological neuron with the artificial neuron because our biological neuron is too fast too fast to work but artificial neuron is not so fast to do such type of work and all types of work also cannot be done with the artificial neuron that's why i have given the command that only some parts of our brain or some parts of our biological neuron can be done with the help of the artificial neuron now this is your structure of the artificial neuron as i have told you so this one actually uh, this is your one and x1 and x2 and xn these are my inputs right what you are finding say for example this one these were my inputs right for example through the dendrites all these inputs are coming and this is representing our soma or cell where all these inputs are coming through the different branches of the dendrites of course there is something is connected with this that is your w not w1 w2 wn as you have seen that these are some terms these are known as weights these are representing the synapses as i have told you that terminal nodes are connected to the dendrites or some other with the help of the synaptic gap these are known as your synapses those synapses representation are uh, uh, carried out by this with the help of this uh, um, weights that is known as your w1 to w0 uh, this w0 you have seen that input it has been given as 1 otherwise the inputs all other inputs as given the x1 to xn this means this w not is the basically the threshold of the neuron or the internal threshold that means a neuron can be active or neuron can be inactive compared to corresponding to the value of this w not that means if this one one is known as your bias if this one is there that means that neuron is active that means neuron is going to do some work for you if it is zero that means the neuron will not work for you right this one or zero this is basically this one this one is basically the bias and this is your internal threshold of the neuron that means if the internal threshold is active then the neuron will work otherwise the neuron will not work though you give some inputs also then also it will be inactive right so to fire the neuron this one is required that is known as your bias and with this one this w not is connected after it is summation that means all these inputs it is coming from the dendrites it will be summed up right the scientist has thought that in the soma though those all the inputs will be summed up and after that some function will be there from which the binary signal or the bipolar signal will be produced now after this summation then again it is going to the function system that is known as your activation function these are known as your activation function or the signal function this activation function is basically the function which we will apply to this net this is your summation this is known as your net input so with this net input the summation or the function will be applied and after that the output will be generated depending on that function what type of function we want to use that we will see in the different slides that what type of function we want to use so scientist have thought just to you know the simulate the biological neuron with this artificial neural network where we are getting the inputs we are getting the one bias that is known as your one which will which is the internal threshold and which will fire the neuron and after that it will be summed up 
in the summation area or uh, aggregation area after that it will be passed through the activation function that is known as your any function which we will see and after the activation function the signal will be generated and the output will come this only i have written in the uh, slide that receives the n input plus a bias term multiplies each input by its weight yes the output that is x1 and w1 these two will be multiplied and then it will be summation in the aggregation rule that means in aggregation part what we will get x1 into w1 x2 into w2 x and dot 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 xn into wn plus 1 into w0 if the w0 is equal to 1 then you will get 1 into 1 that will be plus 1 if the w0 is equal to some other internal threshold then it will be input uh, multiplied with 1 and that threshold will be given to you finally that will be the activation function that i have given here finally we will give the activation function to the sum of the results that i have given here net net means sum of the results and finally we will output the result that we are giving that will be output the result now this is about the artificial neural network as I have shown you the figure. So this is actually your SOMA uh, where you are getting the, all the functions. These dendrites, these are the dendrites. This is input are associated with SI and the weights. Weights here we are giving WIJ. IJ means ith neuron is connected with the jth neuron. So this is my, this is uh, the representation, this is my jth neuron, right? This is my jth neuron and wherever we are getting from the ith neuron, the output is coming from the ith neuron. That's why here we are giving, representing as your SI, that means signal from the ith neuron and it is coming to the jth neuron. And the weights we are giving, that is your WIJ. We are representing as WIJ. WIJ means that ith neuron is coming to the jth neuron. That means jth is the J is your destination, I is your source. Finally, this will be multiplied and this is we are showing that bias. And finally, that will be summation. And the output, this is your function, that is your capital S. This is your function and function of total uh, uh, summation that will be your xj. xj is your total net and the output of the function will be given as, a, as an output. So that has been described here. That is your jth artificial neuron uh, receives the input signal SI from possibly n different sources that I have told you. The internal activation XJ, which is a linear weighted aggregation. Linear weighted aggregation means linearly multiplied. That means S1 into W11, S2 into W12, S3 into W13, like this. And finally, it will be added. Aggregation means it will be added. And finally, the internal threshold is equal to theta j. So it has been described as like this. So what will be your xj? xj is basically you see that I have written here xj. xj is equal to si into wij for each and every node i is equal to 1 to n. That means s1 into w1j, s2 into w2j, s3 into w3j like this. That will be summed up and plus the internal threshold theta j. I have told you why internal threshold is required. Internal threshold is required to fire the neuron, to active the neuron, right? So this is your basic function which we will be using everywhere in the neural network that this is my net connection. Net is your xj which will be summation of the input into wij where i is equal to 1 to n plus theta j, internal threshold of the jth neuron. Right? WIJ, as I have told you, it has been written that it denotes the weight from the neuron I to neuron J. Now the activation of the neuron is subsequently transformed through the signal function S. What are the signal function? Let us see that what are the signal function. Signal function or the activation function nearly in neural network we use these five types of the signal functions. One is your binary threshold, second one is your linear threshold, third one is your sigmoidal function, 
fourth one is your Gaussian function and fifth one is your probabilistic function. That is your, what is the signal function? Signal function we are using that S what we are giving X of XJ. XJ is your net and with the net we will use this signal function S and finally we will get the output. Now first of all by name only we can understand that what is binary threshold. Let us see that what is binary threshold. The function of binary threshold, it is saying that output of the function will be 1 if xj, that is your net, all the summations, weighted sum, if it is greater than or equals to 0 and it will be 0 if it is less than 0. That means in binary threshold, we will get two states, one is 0, another is 1. If xj is less than 0, then we will get 0 and if it is xj is greater than or equals to 0, then we will get 1. But there is a catch here. Catch that is there that at time is equal to 0. For example, if we plot, right, this we are plotting for the binary threshold, you see that at time is equal to 0. We are getting, sorry, at time uh, uh, at uh, uh, qj equal to 0 where theta j we are taking as 0 only because you have seen uh, this function we are telling that xj is equal to here we are telling that xj is equal to wij wij plus theta j right now this wij into xi this is known as your a term we have given that is your qj that we are telling as qj and the theta j is another term that means xj when we are plotting we are telling that xj is equal to qj plus theta j where qj is the summation of all these things right this is my qj now when we are plotting for this binary function we are saying that here the theta j equal to 0 that means only we are getting one term that is only the qj so we are getting the qj so we are saying if xj or qj sorry if xj or qj is equal to 0, then less than 0, it is all values are 0. And for the greater than 0, all values are 1. But there is a steep increase at xj is equal to 0. That means there is some ambiguity at x equal to 0 or uh, xj is equal to 0 or qj is equal to 0. We are getting some point where less than equals to 0 or the greater than equals to 0 and that time it will be the steepest increment. So there is, they are telling, the scientist is telling that we can avoid that, the steepest ambiguity that we can avoid. Before going to this ambiguity, I am just showing you that what are the graphs I have shown here. One is your theta j equal to 0, another is your theta j is equal to plus 3. When theta j equal to plus 3, that means at time minus 3 qj is equal to minus 3 we are getting the 0 value that means it is if it is less than qj is less than or xj is equal to less than minus 3 we will get all the value equal to 0 and if it is greater than equals to minus 3 then we will get all the value equal to 1 because our internal threshold equal to plus 3. If it would have been the minus 3 for example if theta j equal to minus 3 then we will get that at time 3, if it is less than or equal to uh, 3, that time it will be 0. And if it is uh, uh, greater than or equal to 3, if it is greater than or equal to 3, then we will get the 1 value. So depending on the theta j, we will get the graph moved or shifted from its origin value. Either it will go to the left hand side or it will go to the right hand side. Now to remove that ambiguity what we are telling that uh, uh, at time x equal to 0 it will be the steepest increment and we generally we do not get such type of real uh, 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 you know environment where uh, directly we will get the you know steepest value from 0 to 1. So what the scientist has thought they have given the concept of the threshold logic neuron. <clears throat> that is known as your TLN. What it says that to remove this ambiguity, what we can thought of it, that at time xj k plus 1, that means output of the neuron at time k plus 1, it will be 1 if the 
नेट इनपुट ऑफ के के प्लस वन न्यूरोन इफ इट इज ग्रेटर देन इक्वल्स टू जीरो इट इज जीरो इफ इट इज लेस देन इक्वल्स टू जीरो एंड इट विल बी द सेम आउटपुट एज द प्रीवियस इफ इट इज इक्वल टू जीरो दैट मीन्स वॉट एवर वी आर गिवेन इन द फर्स्ट एक्सप्रेशन दैट इफ इट इज इक्वल टू जीरो देन ऑल्सो इट वॉज गिविंग एज वन बट नाउ वी आर टेलिंग that it is not one directly it will be the as previous output that means function what yahan pe uh, here we have given that is function of xj k plus 1 that means at time k plus 1 the output of jth neuron will be equal to 1 if the net input at k plus 1 time jth xj which is greater than 0 and if it is less than 0 then it will be 0 and it will be same as the output of xjk that means if it is equal to 0 xjk plus 1 that means at time k plus 1 if the total summation is 0 then the output will be same as your previous output if the previous output was 0 then it will be 0 if the previous output was 1 then it will be 1 like this we can avoid this ambiguity and finally the scientist from this equation they have developed this equation they are telling that output of xj will be plus 1 if it is greater than 0 and it will be minus 1 if it is less than 0 these two terms they have given to avoid that equal to 0 part and this is known as your bipolar function finally we last time we have seen last slide that this binary means two states that is your zero and one here also we are getting the two states but we are getting the bipolar bipolar means that will be the two states one is your minus one another is your one so with the bipolar state we have uh, you know removed the flaw of the binary threshold function so these are the two functions another is your linear threshold function by linear only you can know you want to know that that will be the linear increment of the signal as i have seen as i have shown here this is the function if it is less than 0 then it will be uh, xj if it is less than equals to 0 then it will be 0 if it is 0 to xm right there are some threshold xm so 0 to xm we are getting the linear value that is our alpha j into xj and if it is greater than equals to xm then we are getting 1 so similar output i have shown here these are the outputs of the matlab programming right you will do the matlab programming and you will see that this type of output is coming so this is your when the theta j again i am taking at theta j equal to 0 and at time at uh, internal threshold theta j equal to minus 1 so when the zero is coming and if we are taking that uh, xm equal to 2 here we are taking that xm equal to 2 and alpha j that is your increment of the linear increment that is your slope that is your 0.5 so uh, we are giving that this is your alpha j that is your 0.5 so accordingly that will be you know the slope will come and at time zero that is theta j equal to zero so qj or xj will be zero so less than zero it will be zero it, here it has written that if xj less than equals to zero then it will be zero zero to xm that will be the uh, linear increment for up to 2 because the xm equal to 2 so zero to xm it will be alpha j into xj and finally it will be one if the xj is greater than equals to xm right so this is your linear threshold function if it is theta j equal to 0 it will be starting from 0 and if it is theta j equal to minus 1 then definitely we will get the zero value to from 1 that means if it is less than 1 since it is minus 1 so if it is less than 1 then we will get the zero and from 1 to that 3 because xm is equal to 2 that means 1 to 3 it will come 3 minus 1 is 2 then it will get the linear function and after that again if it is greater than 3 then we'll get the one value next is a sigmoidal function sigmoidal function is a very important function in case of the neural network very important function because in each and every layer when we will come to the concept of layer in neural network you will see in the hidden layer or in the output layer everywhere we will use this sigmoidal function right 
So sig model function is defined as one by one plus e to the power minus lambda j into x j. As I have told, that is a one by one plus e to the power minus lambda j into x j. Lambda j is the gain scale factor. Lambda j is known as your gain scale factor. That means depending on lambda j, your graph will be either steep. Or it will be smooth. That means it will go from smoother to the non-smoother type. When we will get the this steep signal, that is it will the non-smoothest. But when we will get the simple increment like the smooth increment, that we will say that alpha j is uh, sorry lambda j. It is near about one. So we are seeing the graphs here. This is your the graph of the sigmoidal graph, and we are taking that theta j equal to zero again. So we are getting at time zero, and theta j equal to minus one again. We are getting that uh, 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 it it will be from the one. So at time zero, we are saying that these are the graphs, right? As uh, you are saying that this is the graph, and this is middle one. This is your Lambda j equal to one, and if it is less, then it will go like this, and if it is more, then it will go to the steepest side, right? So this is the most smoothest or the you know uh, the ideal condition that is your lambda j equal to one. And similarly, I have shown that if we change the lambda from either in the negative side or in the positive side, then what will be the graph? Then you can. Uh, use this graph. You can prepare or you can develop these graphs in your MATLAB, and similarly, you can get the idea or the concept that really these graphs are like this or not. I have got these are the snapshots of the MATLAB programming only, right? So this is actually the sigmoidal signal function. We'll go uh, in the next class. We will see that what are the MATLAB commands directly. Also, MATLAB commands are there to create this sigmoidal function. Next is your Gaussian signal function. By the name Gaussian, as you know, the Gaussian distribution, Gaussian noise, and similarly Gaussian signal function. Here it, we have shown that what are the you know what is the distribution or what is the output of the Gaussian signal function. It is e to the power minus x j. That is your net. That is a summation of this minus c j. C j is your center. Center means if your center is zero or center is somewhere else, right? This is your center of the uh, center of the distribution, right? If your center is origin or center is somewhere else. So this is your center and two into sigma j. Sigma j is the Gaussian spread factor, right? This is common in everywhere. You go in mechanical engineering, you go for electrical engineering, you go for electronics engineering. Wherever you find this Gaussian function, it is generally the same. That is your e to the power minus x j. That is your input minus center. That is your c j whole square divided by two into sigma j square. Now, what is sigma j? Sigma j basically describes this, uh, you know, the flatness of your distribution. If the sigma j equal to one, that you will get this type of sigma, and if the sigma j is increasing, then you will get the flatter type of the uh, distribution. And if sigma j is less than one, then you will get the more steep value, right? You will get the More steep value, more steep diagram like this. Otherwise, sigma j, uh, if it is one, then you are getting that this type of, uh, you know, the or uh, um, uh, this type of the ideal distribution. That is your simple this type of distribution you will get. And if the sigma j is greater than one, that automatically you will get the flatter surface, right? You will get the flatter surface. So this is known as your Gaussian signal function. So any type of signal function you can use according to your purpose. That after the net, you can use any signal function. And finally, you will get the output in the binary signal only, right? So these are the summary of the signal functions. I have told that one is your binary threshold, another is your bipolar threshold. I have told one and minus one that will be named as your bipolar. Then we have told simple linear 
that is your alpha j into x j. But if I say some threshold is there, that is your x m value is there for the threshold, then it is known as a linear threshold. That means simple linear and the linear threshold. Then is your sigmoidal function I have given. This is your sigmoidal. And sigmoidal function we have given that is your hyperbolic tangent. What is hyperbolic tangent? I will show you in the next slide. I have given some MATLAB commands. And after that, we are giving the Gaussian. And then finally is your stochastic, right? Stochastic is the probabilistic. With probability Pxj, it will be is equal to 1. It will give the output is equal to 1. And with the probability that is 1 minus Pxj, but not happening, then it will give the minus 1. So the output will be plus 1 and output will be minus 1 with the help of this stochastic. With the probability Pxj, it will be plus 1. With the probability 1 minus Pxj, that will be the minus 1. So these are the various signal functions which we use in neural network for the activation function. right? Now this is a simple MATLAB program to write some activation function. Let us see what it has given. Finally, first of all, we have seen very, very simple function. You can just note down and you can just try yourself. And after that, you can tell me that for how you can change. First of all, this is given. That is your input. That is your x equal to minus 10 to plus 10. You know all, uh, I, I suppose that everybody knows MATLAB programming. That is a minus 10 is your initial value. And plus 10 is your final value. And with the step size, that is your 0.1, right? So minus 10 up to 10 with the uh, uh, step size 0.1. After that, we have given that e to the power minus x, right? e to the power minus x. For what? For the sigmoidal function. You have seen for the sigmoidal function we are getting, that is 1 by 1 plus e to the power minus x. If lambda j equal to 1, you take the uh, ideal value that time you will get the function 1 by 1 plus e to the power minus x. So that only we are going to do here. That is your TMP is equal to e to the power minus x. And the y1, that is your one output, one function we are writing, that is 1 divided by 1 plus TMP. That means 1 divided by 1 plus e to the power minus x. That means we are getting the sigmoidal function. And you know this is dot and slash, it means point to point multiplication or the point to point division. So this is your first function. Second function we are giving that is your y2 equal to 1 minus TMP divided by 1 plus TMP. That means we are getting the function 1 plus e to the power minus x divided by 1 minus e to the power minus x. So I have told in the uh, uh, previous slide, the function that is your hyperbolic tangent, right? Hyperbolic tangent. So hyperbolic tangent function is generally this. That is your 1 plus e to the power minus x divided by 1 minus e to the power minus x. This is known also, this is hyperbolic tangent definitely. This is also known as your bipolar sigmoidal function. Why it is known as your bipolar, I will tell you. This is also known as your bipolar sigmoidal function. That means first function we have given, that is your only sigmoidal, 1 by 1 plus e to the power minus x. And the second function I have given, that is your 1 plus e to the power minus x divided by 1 minus e to the power minus x. And that is known as your hyperbolic tangent function or the bipolar sigmoidal function. And third one is a linear function. That is your y3 equal to x. We will get the linear function. After that, what we have done, we have given the subplot. Subplot, you must be knowing. That is 2 and 3. That means 2 rows and the 3 columns. Right? That means 2 into 3, 6. Out of 6, first uh, quarter, that will be given the plot y1. Second one, it will be plot y2. And the third one, it will be plot y3. Simple command we have given. Three functions we have generated and three functions we have plotted. Now, what type of plot you will get? Now, first plot, that is your sigmoidal function. If you give that only 1 by 1 plus e to the power minus x, so you will get the function like only this. You will get only this type of function. That is your only sigmoidal function. Second one I have told that is your bipolar sigmoidal. That is nothing but a 
not only the only floor 0 and 1, it will go from minus 1 to 1. This is your bipolar sig model or the hyperbolic tangent. That means when you will draw the 1 plus e to the power minus x divided by 1 minus e to the power minus x, then you will get this type of value. And finally, the y3, that is your only x, that you will get the linear value, that is your x. So this type of three graphs you will get in case of the uh, these signal functions. That means these signal functions we are creating yourself. But MATLAB has already done that for you and you can get the function and you can directly generate this signal function that we will see in the next session. Right now, let us about the comparison between the ANN and the BNN, that is your biological neural network and the artificial neural network. I have told you that its speed is your binary biological neural network is your millisecond, ANN we are getting a nanosecond. But there is a billions of neurons are present in your biological neural network which can do work for so many of works for us. But in case of ANN, it is not possible definitely to, uh, you know, change all these billions of neurons. So here we will get only the limited number of the computational neurons. And hence, that's why it is difficult. It is saying that it is difficult to solve the complex pattern recognition, right? So complex pattern recognition, it is very difficult. But our brain is too much intelligent, you know. So oh, whatever complex, whatever complex, you know, the uh, uh, model we see, immediately we recognize. But if we want to do the simulation with this artificial neural network, it is not possible because of the limitations of this number of computational neurons. Now, next point is your storage. Storage, it is saying that or definitely we have the memory and the storage in our biological neural network. Here also, definitely we uh, have the uh, storage system. But there is a something difference in this case. In biological neurons, the previous information do not are not wasted. We have the previous information also, and we can add or you know stimulate the many new 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 information. But by this, we do not forget the previous information or what we had done in your our childhood. We remember that also. But in case of ANN, it is not possible. Whenever you will get the new information, the previous information will be lost. But another advantage is that that in case of the ANN or the artificial neural network the storage is your distributed type that means you are calculating the information and all immediately you are distributing all this information to the other neurons whoever will get this type of who want this type of information and after that again you update that information and again finally you distribute that information to the other neurons so storage system is your distributed system but definitely that is a point disadvantage is there that previous information will be lost and the new information will be added but in case of bnn it is not Fault tolerance. Information is distributed in the connection, so fault tolerant. It is fault tolerant. ANN are inherently not fault tolerant, but somewhat it is fault tolerant also because in this sense, it is absolutely not fault tolerant. This statement will be wrong, but it is also, it is, it is, you know, the percentage of fault tolerance is uh, less compared to your biological neural network, neuron. Uh, it is somewhat fault tolerant, I am saying that in this sense, because when you uh, give, when you train your network with some, you know, the shapes, for example, you are training your network to understand the letter A, right? You have trained in many ways. You have given various types of input of A, you know, different types of A, and you have learned your network that whenever the any A will be input, it will recognize as A, right? But when we do the ANN, somewhat if you are giving the disturbance in the shapes of A, then also it will understand that this, this is the uh, character A. That means wherever the data is, uh, you know, somewhere is uh, um, disturbed also, then also your network is liable enough to recognize. So from that point of view, you can say that these are fault tolerant. 
control mechanism no central control mechanism is present in bnn but here we have the central control mechanism so these are various difference between the ann and the bnn so till now we have uh, learned about that what are the biological neuron and what are the artificial neuron and what are the different types of the signal function and what is the difference between the ANN and BNN. Now after artificial neuron our main aim to make the network because our brain is a network of neurons. There I will show some videos you will get some concept that what as the basic nature of the brain and the neurons. So we also in our real life uh, uh, world also we want that some network with this artificial neurons. So it is defined as artificial neural networks are massively parallel adaptive network. There are four terms massive then parallel then adaptive then it is a network. Of course it is a network because it is a consisting of many networks massively parallel. That means it is uh, uh, no sequential function is there. All the neurons can work in your real world that is uh, with the artificial neurons. You can do the this thing that all the neurons can work parallelly. Adaptive. It is very adaptive. The artificial neural network is adaptive in nature because any change of environment it can be learned. Any change of environment. Sometimes you have given the temperature is high, you can give temperature is minimum. You can give temperature is middle. Right? So any type of changing of environment it can be input to the your neural network and it it can learn at any point of time. It is not that that and the input only at the first time only you have to give the adaptive environmental inputs. At any time you can change the input and automatically your neural network can learn those things. Nonlinear computing element. This is the another term nonlinear. Since we are getting the sigmoidal function I have told you the sigmoidal function we are using both in the hidden layer as well as in the output layer. And sigmoidal function again I am giving 1 plus e to the power minus x. So this is your nonlinear in nature. So that's why it is telling that it consists of the simple nonlinear computing elements called neurons which are intended to abstract or model some of the functionality there is a catch that is your sum of the functionality of the human nervous system it cannot replace your human nervous system but it can only be changed right so functionality some of the functionality of the human nervous system in an attempt to partially capture some so this is the definition of the artificial neural network artificial neural network that means it is defined as these are the massively parallel adaptive network consisting of the nonlinear computing elements to model some of your work of your human nervous system with some strength that is your computational strength. These are the basic characteristics of artificial neural network. It is parallel and I have told you that neural network process information in parallel. Nonlinearity that also I have covered that nonlinear interconnections and nonlinearity in distributed throughout. Input output mapping. Input output mapping means they can map with the input patterns to their associated output patterns. That means I have told you that if you are training <coughs> the network to <coughs> recognize A right so you have learned the network to recognize a so anything input you are giving it can map to your associated output that what type of a it is right so similarly uh, doctors can uh, you know learn the next point is learning only that is a learn by examples for example uh, let us take the real life cases of a doctor right every time we if we fall sick then we want to go to the senior doctor Right? We don't want to go to recently uh, who had done the MBBS <clears throat> because in our mind also it is there that whoever the senior doctor is there he has many type of type of experiences. So whenever we will go and he will uh, make it a point that we will be fine within a single day. But we don't have we don't we don't want to keep faith to the uh, you know the uh, junior doctor. So 
because because they have learned the senior doctors have learned to it examples they have many examples and they have learned to it example similarly in case of neural network also they learn with examples if you give many inputs <coughs> for example in thousands in 10000 in 12000 if you give five example then also neural network will learn if you give 100 examples then also neural network will learn if you get 10000 then also neural network will learn but the neural network with 10000 examples they have learned with 10000 examples that will give you the most accurate result so that's why the neural network whenever we do the neural network function we make it a point that database should be your huge database so that you can learn the network again and again again and again and your network becomes so accurate that whenever you will give the input immediately it will map with an output and it will give the output fault tolerant as i have told can recall the full patterns from incomplete data also noisy patterns for example i have told that we have uh, for example created the network for a and if you give something you know this type of a also then also it will learn that this is a so it has the capability so this is known as your fault tolerant adaptability it can adapt any free parameters any time you can enter any type of parameters it is adaptive response it can give the confident response if you give the more number of examples you are confident that the output from your neural network will be accurate accurate means accurate it can be 99.5% accurate also even 99.7% accurate in some of the research examples we see if we use the neural fuzzy and optimization technique to reduce the error then we can find out the 99.7% accuracy in some problems but that depends on definitely first that is your database it should be the huge database right so this is your general characteristics and it is the different uh, this already we have done but anyway i i am just telling you that what are the different eight components of artificial neural network first component is your neurons there are three neurons here one is your input neurons another term now you have got one is your hidden term and another is your output input and output already we have seen that what is your input and what is your output hidden terms is there that intermediate functions or the intermediate calculations that will be done uh, uh, with the help of the hidden neurons another is your activation state vector that we have given the vector of the xi these are all the activation state vector signal function after the aggregation we are giving the signal function that we we have studied about the signal function different types of signal function then the connectivity can be done in a three ways one is your plus one is your minus another is your zero what is the connectivity connectivity are the weights for example you have this these are the inputs for example x1 this is the input and x2 this is the output so the input are going to your uh, soma or the aggregation function and here you are giving the term for example plus 0.5 and here the output you are giving the minus 1 and finally you are getting some output and you are giving to some you know uh, activation function for example this is your uh, bipolar activation function and then you are getting some output so this plus 5 0.5 and the minus 1 these are known as your excitatory or inhibitory these are term is there if the weight is your plus that means it is a winning neuron if it is a minus that means it is not a winning neuron so it is your inhibitory neuron and it is the excitatory neuron and if there are no weights that is known as your absent that means this input doesn't have any work with the neuron right so these are the different types of connectivity or different types of weights are associated with the neurons aggregation rule as i have told that all the weighted sum will be aggregated right that i have told only that will be aggregated into the into a cell after that activation the function we are giving that will be uh, some rule it will follow so that will be the activation rule and finally the learning rule there is a lot of number of learning rules are there that we will learn in the next session 
by the name I can say that is your heavy on learning method, then is your delta learning method, perceptron learning method, back propagation learning method, then winning learning, competition learning method, gradient descent learning method. There are various types of learning method. RBF is also the learning method. SOM, uh, 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 the uh, self-organizing uh, map, SOM, Kohenon self-organizing map. So that is also one learning method. So uh, we will try to, uh, you know, the complete this learning method somewhere. We will get that. Uh, mostly, I will try to cover all these learning methods. Uh, there is maybe the two types of environment that may be the noiseless or the noisy environment. The noiseless environment is known as your deterministic, and the stochastic is known as your noisy, where we go for the probabilistic function. Sorry. So this is your uh, probabilistic or the deterministic or the stochastic function. Right? Now the historical development, as I have told you, that what are the learning methods. So first development was in Mac, Kulak, and Pitts model. Second, 1949, Hebb's learning or the Hebb's uh, learning rule had been uh, developed. In 1958, Perceptron was developed. In 1969, Adeline and Madeline network has been developed. In 82, Hoffville network has been developed. 1972, there is a Cohenon so self-organizing map has been developed. 88, Grossberg learning method has been developed. 88, radial basis function, that is your RBF. And in 1990, support vector machine has been developed. With these, all these methods, till today, the people are doing the research work in modifying all those, uh, you know, uh, learning method. And uh, uh, it is, it is, uh, you know, the uh, research processes is going on all these learning methods. Let us see what are the main applications of the artificial neural network. I have taken only one example here, that is to, just to tell you that how the it can be done. One is a fingerprint recognition. Very uh, concise way I will tell that what are the steps involved in fingerprint recognition and how the neural network can be used to extract the features. So one is your pre-processing system. When we'll do the fingerprint recognition, there are four steps. One is your pre-processing system. Another is your feature extraction using neural network. Then we do the classification. And finally, we do the recognition or the result. Now let us take this as the one sample uh, uh, fingerprint. Now these are the steps involved in fingerprint recognition. First of all, we uh, acquisition, image acquisition, that means we acquire the image, right? Whatever fingerprint is there, we acquire the image. After that, we do the edge detection. Edge detection is nothing but to remove the noise from the edges and we detect the edges that what is the edges of this image, right? Next is a ridge extraction. Ridge is nothing but the uh, nerves in the present in your uh, finger uh, thumb. That is your nerves. Nerves are known as your ridges. After that, we do the thinning. Thinning is nothing but a skeletalization of the image. We do we get the skeletalization of the image. After that, we do the feature extraction. That means with basically fingerprint recognition, it will do the ridge. Uh, um, uh, recognition only. Whatever the, uh, you know, the uh, nerves are there, they are very unique depending on the person to person. So we will extract some features from these ridges and finally we will do the classification and we will say that this is the uh, um, uh, fingerprint of A and this is the fingerprint of B, this is the fingerprint of C. Somewhere after uh, two days, when we'll see, we will uh, give the thumb impression or the uh, this thing to the image, then it will understand that with those features, it will understand that it is the fingerprint of A or B or C. So this is, after that, we'll get the full system of the fingerprint recognition. So the image is digitized generally. We digitize this image into 512 by 512 because you image the, acquire the image. After that, we block into the 512 by 512. After that, we do the edge detection and the thinning. Edge detection, I have told you, this is nothing but uh, to remove the noise. And how to do the edge detection? This is basically the grayscale images changes. That means wherever it is changing the grayscale level, this is we are taking as a gray image only. 
that depending on the pixel intensity only we can check that this is your final edge right and orientation of the edges ridges also we take care of because ridges can be orient into the left side or right hand side or the straight so depending on this we can change the orientation so this is your edge detection after that we ridge extraction that means we take the pixel values and the ridges are extracted now what are the thinning and the feature extraction thinning is basically the skeletalization as i have told so this is your uh, skeletalization this is your thinning method and after that we uh, extract the features now what are the features i'm sorry this is your spelling is wrong this should be your u uh, now what are the features these are the ridge bifurcation and ridge ending these are the main features for the fingerprint recognition one is your ridge bifurcation and i have shown that what is bifurcation this is known as your ridge bifurcation and ridge end what is the end end of the ridge this is your end of the ridge and this is your bifurcation of the ridge so this type of feature extraction we do and after the feature extraction will be done using the neural network that how accurately you can extract the feature that comes under neural network and after that we do the classification and classification can be done you know that is your arc that is how what type of arc you have and what type of tented arc you have what you have the right loop or you have the left loop so for example up depending upon this criteria we can classify the all the you know the images and finally we get the recognition that this is the uh, you know thumb or the uh, fingerprint recognition of uh, something uh, somebody else so uh, next is your other uh, applications what are the other applications other applications are that is your recognition of the criminals then security in case of the laptops and lockers in elections who has voted or who have not voted to count individuals there are different types of applications of the fingerprint recognition where we can use this fingerprint recognition and uh, the other applications of neural network are that is your character recognition image compression stock market market prediction for the prediction uh, uh, net uh, prediction purposes also neural network is widely used for earthquake prediction for uh, this stock market prediction right uh, for the this another uh, important function is your traveling salesman problem or the electronic no security and the home application for this purposes also we use this neural network now there are some principles before doing the applications let me just tell that what are the basic principles of this application what you should take care of in your mind when you will do the neural network applications the solution of a problem must be simple it should not be complex complex recognition you cannot do quite accurately with the help of the neural network complicated solution waste time and resources if a problem can be solved with a small lookup table then neural network is doesn't come under picture neural network comes under picture that when you cannot do with the help of the tabular forms that comes then comes the neural network in picture online neural network solution should be very simple using many layer neural networks i have told you that input layer hidden layer and the output layer input and output layer definitely will be there now it is your own uh, suggestion that how how many types of hidden layer you will provide and how many neurons you will provide in the hidden layer that definitely your suggestion but i i am telling you that when we increase the number of neurons and the number of hidden layer definitely we get the Uh, high accuracy but it doesn't mean that many number of layers or many neurons it will give because the computational cost also will be increased if you come to your uh, really hardware implementation of this then computational cost or the number of resources or the number of you know the uh, uh, objects whichever will be required for implementation of this neural network that also comes into the picture so many layer neural network should be avoided if possible complex learning algorithm should be avoided if possible a prior knowledge should be used prior knowledge right prior knowledge should be used uh, uh, for uh, you know setting the parameters 
all the available data should be collected about, about the problem redundant data is usually a smaller problem than not having the necessary data you should have the necessary data and huge data with you the data should be partitioned into training validation and testing again the three new terms we have got one is your training another is your validation third one is your testing for example you have 100% data or 100 data 100 database 100 images you have so 70 images we will do for training the network right 70 images 70% 70 of the data we use for training 15% we use for validation that whether you are correct your network is correct or whether your network is wrong if your validation is wrong again you go for the network designing with those 70% data and finally you have validated the data after that 15% you take as a testing data generally what we do we take for example the character recognition generally this research problem ME thesis or the students do like this they take for example five characters five person character with those five persons only they train with those five persons data only they validate with those five percent only they test and finally they say that we have got the hundred percent accuracy in our method but that is the wrong case you have to take ten seven uh, data seven uh, character you can take for the training and one data you can take for the one or two data you can take for the validation and another one or two data you can take for the testing then only you will get the accurate or accuracy of your neural network but generally we do like this whatever we are doing for training those only we are using for validation those only we are using for the testing data but this is not the case 70 percent 15 percent and 15 percent your data should be partitioned like this the neural network solution of a problem should be selected from a large enough pool of potential solutions because of the nature of the neural networks it is likely that if a single solution is built then that will not be the optimal one right you may not get the single solution that means you are getting the good solution you are getting the optimal solution so don't be disheartened that if you are getting the same solution you you are getting a number of solutions is there so don't worry finally you will get the optimal one right if a pool of potential solutions is generated and trained it is more likely that one which is close to the optimal one is found and and is accurate so these are my questions so i will uh, you just note down these questions and i will ask these questions at the end of the not session at the end of our course so these are the six questions are the immune cells part of the nervous system can an artificial neuron receive inhibitory and excitatory inputs simultaneously do the Gaussian neurons use the sigmoidal activation function? Can we use the general optimization method to calculate the weights of neural networks with a single nonlinear layer? Does the application of neural networks increase the speed of simple games? This is your according to the games application. Should we have the validation data set when we train the neural network? this I have already given the answer of this so these are the six questions of our this session so before say thank you uh, let me just uh, uh, tell you about some uh, two uh, you know um, videos that you can just understand that what are the uh, uh, actual you know the movement of the brain
is a simulation of a single biological neuron. Information flows in, is processed by the neuron, and the results flow out. Technology duplicates this by creating a structure that processes information like a biological neuron does, except this process is mathematical instead. Just like the biological neuron, information flows in, is processed by the artificial neuron, and the results flow out. This single process becomes a mathematical formula that can be used for simple problems. For those that are mathematically inclined, this will look similar to a polynomial. Polynomial will do in the two to the problems it can solve for, as shown in this graph of an order 5 polynomial. If this is all artificial intelligence could do, it wouldn't be much use. As with the brain, artificial neural network's power is in connecting sets of neurons together in layers. When you connect them in layers, the mathematical formula becomes something like a multidimensional polynomial. This allows complex problems, like what is shown in this graph, to be discovered and used for our This time, the input to the second layer is from the output of the first layer. The exact steps for a single layer are simply repeated for each layer of the neural network. Okay, these... Uh, okay, these... Uh, okay, these... Uh, okay, these uh, In this session, we have got the concept and in the from the video, you have got the concept that how the neurons are connected, you know, in our brain and those neurons, how uh, in the next session we will see that uh, how the neurons are, uh, you know, uh, the represented in terms of the layers that is your input layer and hidden layer and the output layer and how these are interconnected with each other. So in this overview of the neural network, we have learned about the biological neuron and the difference between the artificial neuron neural network and the uh, biological ne uh, neural network and also about the various types of signal functions, about the characteristics of the artificial neural network and also the components of the artificial neural network. And I have tried to give you some example and considering that one example I should tell you that is how we do in case of the neural network. This thing we can do with the help of the MATLAB programming also. And uh, thank you so much. The, this is all about uh, uh, about this session. And then the next session we will uh, tell about the neural network architecture.